Hey, Tom. Good morning. How are you? Hi, Louie. I'm good. How are you? I'm good. I'm here. I'm really excited to talk to you today, actually. I stumbled upon you and your work uh, a few days ago, and I was like, who is this person, and how do I get to talk to him? Can you tell us <laughs> what the heck you do? Uh, sure. So, in short, I suppose I recreate the cover of books. Um and I do it using a mixture of photography, collage, painting, crafts, assemblage, basically like anything I can find in my house or at the CVS down the street. <laughs> <laughs> and where is home? Uh, I live in Philadelphia. Brilliant. Now, you did you study art? Um, sort of. Um, so my dad is actually an art professor, so I grew up spending my days after school in his art department, running around, painting, making stuff. Um, so it was a pretty amazing childhood to get to do that. Um, and then in college, I um, I did uh, take photography and art classes and um, have sort of, in my professional life, also gotten to uh, do other things that have driven my art. So um, I work as an urban planner, um, and in my job, I make... I do a lot of graphic work, so I'm very uh, uh, fluent in uh, uh, the Adobe suite, doing Adobe uh, Photoshop and Illustrator, and um, I draw a lot also to uh, as part of my work. So um, many many different kinds of uh, of art uh, studying, but nothing super formal. That sounds really exciting, actually. The whole urban planning. You're like a, a cool Robert Moses, a nicer Robert Moses or something. <laughs> <laughs> um, not quite as powerful or yeah, as, right. uh, as mean-spirited as Robert Moses. I do work in transportation, so um, I design. I do a lot of street design with uh, bicycles and pedestrians and transit. Super important work. And along with that important work is these collection of these covers that you've been designing and not only have you been kind of designing them, but you're also putting yourself in them, which I think is really fascinating. How did you happen to become the literary Cindy Sherman of the art world? (laughs) (laughs) Um, It sort of started by accident. A friend of mine and I were just like taking funny pictures of ourselves. Like we were trying to do like these, we were trying to start a, an Instagram trend, a trend of doing monochromatic outfits, like full head to toe red or blue outfits. And then I ran out of red and blue outfits. And like part of my original um, outfits, I was always like holding a book. And I was like always sort of more inspired by the book than I was by the cal- by the color. And so I was like, maybe I should just start recreating the books uh, myself. And um yeah, I guess I just I'm I'm also just not a person that before this was like super into taking self portraits, and so it's kind of bizarre that this has become <laughs> my thing. But it's it's been uh, really fun. What a journey! Um, yeah, it, well, it seems like it's been such a journey, and I love that it started from this thing that had nothing to do with taking selfies of books, and it turned into that. Uh, and also, it's just a great opportunity to be playful and fun. Now, do you think this COVID experience has been an excuse to be more creative, to be outwardly more goofy and joyous? Oh, for sure. I mean, like previous to this, I feel like my art practice had really um, suffered Uh, for the last few years. I really um, had stopped making art. Um, my professional life, my personal life had sort of just taken over and I just didn't have uh, the space in my life to make the art that I wanted to make. And I think COVID sort of like forced me into (laughs) my creativity again in this really great way. And everything that I was seeing on the internet, everything I was seeing on Instagram was... um, sort of drenched in dread um covid sort of created this gloom and i wanted to do something that made people smile and so this was 
not only an opportunity to get back into the practice of making art, but also um, trying to put something else out there that um, would help, you know? Yeah. I can't, I can't do a whole lot else for people right now, but I can make them smile for five seconds a day. Absolutely. And, and what a, what a thing to do. I mean, yeah, I was captivated and I think your joy is really infectious <laughs> and you can tell that you're having fun and you're not taking yourself too seriously, which honestly as artists, we are trained to take ourselves way too seriously. So it's been fun to go along this journey with you. Can you tell me what's been one of your favorite shoots and, and, have you learned something really weird from these shoots? Oh my God. Um, my favorite shoot was probably for um, the Catherine Lacey book, Nobody is Ever Missing. Um, so the, this is a like a three shot sequence where I am um, in my bathtub and I'm like plunging myself underwater. <laughs> into Mortifying. I figured out in the in the process of making that photo that I could put my iPhone into a Ziploc bag and duct tape it to the side of the bathtub and still manipulate the screen through the Ziploc bag. Um, so I would like put it on self timer like through the Ziploc and then plunge myself <laughs> underwater and take a picture in my bathtub underwater through the Ziploc bag which is only something that you can learn by trying it. <laughs> That's <laughs> brilliant. I found on YouTube. But I I had seen her book on the shelf and if you haven't seen the book before the cover is the illustration is absolutely gorgeous. Um and I was just really really wanting to recreate it and the only place I could possibly do it was my bathtub so I was sort of determined to make it work. That's so cool, uh, because you're also kind of rediscovering and repurposing your very limited environment while we're in uh, quarantine, right? So it's like a scavenger hunt of what you have and what you can make do. Oh, for sure. And I think the early days of that were like the most fun in that regard, because I was not as comfortable making things in the digital environment yet. Like everything was like very physical. Everything was like kind of rough. And so it definitely forced me to like think more within the physicality of my home. And now I've sort of like branched out into environments that are a little less realistic and not really feasible to do within my house. But I think that it's still, still fun in that way. But yeah, I think rediscovering and repurposing your home uh, and well, I think that this project has like helped me to like rethink literally every object. In my <laughs> Isn't that house. great? Yeah. Like how it can be part of a picture. Um, laundry baskets, the chairs of legs or the legs of chairs rather. Um, l like literally everything around you can be used in some way. So um, yeah. yeah, it's been a blast. You recreated one of my favorite book covers that I think really has influenced me in my own art practice, which is The Lord of the Flies. Mm. I stared at that book forever when I was a kid because it was just so mysterious and so organic and beautiful uh, that when you did it, it just brought a different layer of like joy to it, you know, because it was fun and it was funny almost. Uh, so I really enjoyed that. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I just like pulled, I had like an overgrown plant in my, uh, in my bedroom that I just pulled some fronds off of, um, and figured out how to tie into my hair. And I, I grabbed some like dirt out of my backyard and smeared it on my face. <laughs> <laughs> it's performance art as well. Wow. That's fantastic. Yeah. Can I ask you, so I, I can assume that I can say that you're a, you're a book lover. I am, yeah. How did I that do. start? Um, I grew up in a family of readers, for sure. Like, my m mom and my sister, my mom always had, like, a huge stack of books next to her bed. She was constantly reading. And my sister is the same way. Um, it, but I think they, like, were more into science fiction. I was always, like, a fiction kid. And I loved collecting books, too. Like, I love the aesthetic of books and I loved like those like those series of books that had hundreds and hundreds of books within them because I love the aesthetic of seeing them wind up like I think I had like every boxcar children book and I just love to like look at them up on my wall because yeah. they're all these like sort of various shades of like 
pastel. <laughs> um, so yeah, I started reading at an early age and I really found early on that I love fiction. And um, so yeah, I've, I've sort of been a pretty big reader my whole life. And, you know, I go similar to my art practice, I go through like phases of reading and not reading. And sometimes I'll read like five or six books in a month and sometimes I'll go months without reading. And, um, but I think that this practice has also sort of helped me to rekindle my love of reading too, because I'm like, const- like now that I have this Instagram following I'm constantly being like, um, uh, inundated with like new and amazing books. And so, yeah, it's definitely pushed me to, to read more as well. Has there been a a narrative in the thread of books that you've chosen to recreate that in somehow or the other you're telling a story through these book covers? Ooh, um, not one that I'm necessarily aware of, but I definitely see a narrative of in terms of like the types of books that I'm starting to choose. I think I'm finding myself more attracted to um, books that have illustrated covers that aren't really all that realistic um, because I feel like there's more um, there's more to play with there. Absolutely. There's so much re- like recreation photography that's happening that's like really focused on um, making it as exact as possible and I love I think I'm more interested in like grasping the feeling of something and then sort of turning it a little bit on its head um, or like adding it, adding something to it. Like I love that tradition in like folk music where like people will cover a song and then add another verse to it. Like Jeff Buckley, like added a verse to hallelujah. Like I sort of feel like I'm doing that with recreation by like taking uh maybe an illustration that has a serious face and then doing something a little bit different with it where people can recognize that like this was the like this is the intention is this original cover but there's also like this feeling to it like it's this book but with like this layer of covid and this layer of humor to it that's so important, the, the element to mix these things that you really don't see in the periphery, right? Like this, a riff like music and, and mixing the book, mixing with photography. That's really cool. You also, I, one of my favorite um, covers that you did was the Phantom Tollbooth because you oh. were play, you were playing with, with the, the shading of the book because the book is very simple in its appearance, but you were, I, I got that play that you were coming for. And is that your dog? That is my dog, yeah. So cool. I love that. What other books are you are in the pipeline? Ooh. Um there's so there are like some that um I have not figured out how to do yet that I'm ah, really excited fun. about. Um I really love Elena Ferranti. Um and uh her book the covers of her books are actually like some of my least favorite ever but something (laughs) about how much I dislike the covers is what why I want to do them um so my brilliant friend has like uh is it my brilliant friend it's like one in that that Neapolitan series has like her in a wedding dress with her husband and like these three little uh flower girls and they're like on the coast of Naples <laughs> and it's just like, it looks like a bad romance novel nice. and I really want to recreate it. Cause it's like the best book I've ever read with the worst cover. Oh, that's um, smart. That's interesting. There's something, there's something about that interplay of like, um, of like dislike and love that I want, <laughs> that I am really interested in recreating because there's a lot of camp. There's a lot of potential for camp there. Yes. Um, the book Swamplandia is one that I just came across recently that has like this sort of fantastical cover of like a man sitting on a branch with his daughter on his shoulders. And there's like a huge alligator coming out of the water. Um, <laughs> oh, I'd love to see that. Not possible in real life, but would like, I would love to try to recreate. And would you be both person, both characters? Um, 
I'm thinking about trying to get my niece uh, uh, nice. to like taking a picture of her and like having her like digitally imposed on my shoulders. And then um, I do sort of want to get into sculpture too um, and like have the alligator be sculpted um, coming out of the water. Uh, and all of that has been made possible by like getting more comfortable in like the, the digital collage realm as well. So, um, but yeah, those are, those are a couple that, I'm aiming to do. I don't want to reveal all of my secrets. <laughs> Just yet, right? Yeah. Well, I love that. I love that journey that you're taking us because you can tell that you are kind of uh, flexing your muscles a little bit more and more and getting more loose with your material and your uh, media. That's really exciting. I also read that you are a huge Philly lover, that you love your city. And can you advise anyone listening now who's in quarantine and can't wait to get out of here? If we make our way to Philadelphia, where should we go? What should we not miss? Um, okay, so Philadelphia is an incredible city and it's an amazing place to eat. Ah. And so I would direct you to like a million different restaurants. Um, uh, so there's uh, a place that's just gotten some like really uh, amazing press called Kalea, which is a Thai restaurant in South Philly. Um, it just got nominated. It's a finalist for the James Beard Award wow. um, this year. So I think that's that's like really one of my favorite places. Um, slightly lower brow, uh, <laughs> John's Roast Pork. So one of the like one of the big things in Philly is like everyone thinks Philly cheesesteak is like the Philly. <laughs> sandwich but like roast pork sandwiches are like the real traditional like italian sandwich in philadelphia and this place is like kind of in no man's land sort of near like a home depot <laughs> <laughs> and a parking lot um and it makes the best roast pork sandwich um around uh we also have amazing like indonesian food and southeast asian food um it's a super Philly's like this really amazing, super diverse city. And I think that we all sort of um, come together around food. So um, those would be my big suggestions. Okay. I also love um, for museums. I mean, the Philly art museum is really solid. Um, the Eastern state penitentiary is one of my favorites. Cool. So they've, cre they've, um, turned what was a former prison into a museum um and uh it's sort of got this abolitionist bent um and really about like gets into like issues of like the prison industrial complex and uh the history of prisons uh, in a way that's really incredible. So wow. I would highly suggest um, checking that out. It's also really spooky. So <laughs> if you like spooky things, Eastern State Penitentiary is a great place to check out. Oh, that sounds exciting. Thanks. I'll have links in the show notes. Can you tell me a little bit about your first experience with art that made you want to dive in and create art? Oh, my first experience with art. Um... I know you said your parents are artists. Does, does that play into that? Oh, for sure. I mean, yeah, I've been surrounded by art since birth, basically. So my dad, my dad is a um, is a painter and teaches drawing as well. And so um, he's always had an easel set up in his office and was painting. And he sort of um, works. Uh, his paintings now are more natural, but in the past they were very collage based. Oh. Um, and so, but they weren't, they were like collage paintings. Like he painted everything that was part of the collage. Sure. Um, so I think that that seeing him, like seeing my dad paint these like incredibly realistic, um, paintings was always really inspiring and I wanted to be as good as he was. Um, I'm not as good as he is. He's incredible. Did that make it easier or harder to explore your own talents? I think it definitely made it easier. Because oh, wow. um, uh, my dad was always 
there to like support me with materials i guess nice. he would always think, like if i ever like wanted to paint or to draw he would go and buy me the paint he would go and buy me the materials to like start on my project regardless of like how serious i was about it and so like i started painting with acrylics and oils at like a really young age like i started doing like large drawings at a young age i learned how to like throw pots and um build sculptures out of clay really young because he was so supportive and i had access to the materials so i think without his influence i would not be here i remember one of like my standout memories um was in third grade i had like a parent teacher conference and I was there with my dad and my teacher pulled out this picture that I had drawn that was super weird. Like it was very strange. It was a bunch of like, I I think I had just learned how to draw cubes. And so I had like all of these different size cubes that I had built in like three dimension or I had drawn in three dimension. And they had like these like weird um, like worms, which in retrospect probably seemed pretty phallic. <laughs> <that> were, like, <laughs> coming at that were like sort of like billowing out of these cubes and she's like i'm a little bit worried about tommy's drawings and my dad was like oh that's cool like i like that tom good work and she was like flabbergasted she, it was like this catholic school teacher who was really worried about me and my dad was like that's great like keep it up <laughs> that's a fantastic story oh god i hope parents are taking notes yeah that's a great experience yeah, so support your kids. Let your kids be as weird as they want. Right. Well, other than creating these amazing recreations of book covers, are you doing anything else to get you through this moment in time? Are you reading something or are you moved by something in particular? Oh, yeah. I mean, I've been reading a ton and I've been... Uh, I'm also working from home full time right now, so... Um, while I'm working, I've been like listening to audiobooks, nice. and so some of the, I think the audiobooks have like really helped inspire me to like go work on my uh, on my art afterwards. I just listened um, to uh, Justin Torres's book, We the Animals, which is like um, it's a really short book. I think it's only like 125 pages and the podcast or the audio book in total is like three hours long. Um, it was made into a, a movie, right? It was made into a movie. Yeah. It's, it's like so poetic and like raw and gorgeous. Um, and I think it's just, I think like having that literary, piece back in my life has been is keeping my brain from going to mush Absolutely. and is like helping me to and in, helping inspiring my work also so yeah like there's so many um great apps out there for listening to audiobooks while you work if you if reading isn't your thing but um yeah i I um shout out to the philly free library for having so many uh great audio books and um, digital books online. Yes, support our libraries, every which one of them, you know, it's fantastic. Now, before I let you go, I need your advice. I'm my, one of my sisters having a baby and mm -hmm. I want to get her a book. What book would you give to a newborn? Not necessarily so she can read now, but something with a nice message that, that might carry you through to have a good experience in life. Oh man, baby books are not my thing, but they can be uh, adult books. Anything with a good message, really. I, I, I'm going to assume this baby's going to be brilliant, and we'll be able to read as soon as she's out of there. <laughs> huh? What's my favorite book for a kid? Hmm. I mean, I do love uh, anything by Shel Silverstein, <laughs> like where the where the sidewalk ends, slide in the attic which are both books that I've done are like yeah. two of my favorites as a kid and sort of made me, uh, they're so silly and like encourage kids to be weird in themselves. And I think that that's so important. Yeah. So I think those would, th those two would be, um, pretty high on my list. 
Awesome. Well, you mentioned Silverstein. I can't let you go without asking you. What's your opinion on the giving tree? I always oscillate, and I'm not sure how I feel about it. Oh, my God. The giving tree is so gutting to me. Um, this culture of, like, take and take and take. And I don't know. I'm, like, all about taking care of yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that you can, like... I, I think giving to giving I think that um that message of like giving until you have nothing. literally nothing <laughs> left like, until you're a stump is probably not a good one and like you're most capable of giving um when you have that energy to give so I I'm gonna go with the giving tree as a bad message <laughs> <laughs> good yeah I, yeah it's weird right yeah I feel the same way I wonder where he was coming from when he was writing it. I mean, I'm sure it's, it was a different time, obviously, the context. Uh, but yeah, it just, it just, I wonder if he was making a commentary on man, you know? Oh, probably. I think it was like before lots of people were going to therapy, though, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Well, Tom, thank you so much for uh, connecting with me and uh, selling me on Philadelphia. I'm really excited to plan a trip. And uh, yeah. I'm excited to see you make more of these book covers. I really am. Absolutely. Yeah, if you come to Philly, let me know. Oh, absolutely will. You have a great day.